So we are going to continue with life in the Paleozoic era. The first appearance of animal skeletons and hard parts is seen in rocks from the Paleozoic era. Hard parts include skeletons, shells, bones, scales, teeth. So once we had animals with hard parts, they're able to be preserved in the fossil record more easily than soft-bodied organisms. If you think about a soft-bodied organism like a jellyfish, that type of organism is not going to leave much evidence of their existence in the fossil record. So most of our fossils include organisms with hard parts, which we start to see in Paleozoic rocks. So life in the early Paleozoic was restricted to seawater or in the water as opposed to on land. And we had several groups of invertebrates. Invertebrates are organisms that do not have a backbone. So that includes trilobites, cephalopods. An example of a cephalopod is a squid, sponges, and corals. So those are organisms that we would have found in the early Paleozoic ocean water. So here, down here is a picture of a representation of what the early Paleozoic ocean floor may have looked like. So during the Cambrian period, if we just look back, Cambrian is here at the start of the Paleozoic. So during the Cambrian, we have what's called the Cambrian explosion. And animal diversification appears to have accelerated rapidly from 535 to 525 million years ago. Diversification means you go from a small number of species to a large number of species. So when you have a lot of different types of species, that's diversification. So then we're going to just start talking about different types of species. So we have fish. When did fish first appear? Fish first appeared in the fossil record in the Ordovician. Again, Ordovician is here. But during the Devonian, it's considered to be the age of the fishes, and that's because we had mass diversification of fish species during the Devonian. So again, going back here, Ordovician is when we see the first fish, but the Devonian is when we had diversification of fish. So you had lots of different species that came into existence during the Devonian. So we call that the age of the fishes. And some of the early fish were armored and they were active predators. So here's a Dunkleosetus and it has armor on it, like a, a hard armor. And look at those huge teeth. So this is kind of, um, this looks like a predator, right? So, a type of fish called lobe-finned fish adapted to life on land and eventually gave rise to the first amphibians. So here is a model of an early lobe-finned fish. So it's still a fish, but its fins were muscular and short and stout allowing the fish to walk. So these early vertebrates that were these lobe-finned fish that adapted and eventually gave rise to amphibians still had problems with living on land though, as opposed to living in the water, which fish are adapted for living in the water. 
So these, the problems included drying out. Okay, they had, they had the potential for drying out like their bodies because their skin, they're still evolved from animals that were used to living in water. Reproduction, for example, where could they safely lay their eggs? Because amphibian eggs are more like fish eggs where they don't have a hard shell. Also, how are their bodies going to deal with the effects of gravity? And how would their body get oxygen from the atmosphere? Because fish use gills to get oxygen from the water. So then how would the early land animals be evolved to get oxygen? Right? They're not going to use gills anymore to, to get oxygen from water. So the adaptations of these lobe finned fish included skeletons that were more able to support their bodies as opposed to fish living in the water. They don't have to deal with the same effects of gravity because the water allows them to be more buoyant. So they developed those muscular short legs. Well, they're not legs, they're, they're fins, but they sort of acted like legs. And they developed lungs where they could breathe air instead of relying on gills to absorb gases from water. They had lungs. But they still needed to be near water in order to reproduce. So modern day amphibians, we could look at frogs that lay eggs in the water and then the eggs hatch into tadpoles which look like fish and they live in the water until they go through a metamorphosis and turn into frogs that live on land. And amphibians generally need to live near water so because their bodies can dry out. Now, what about plants? Land plants also face problems of drying out. They face problems related to gravity and reproduction. So vascular plants developed in the Ordovician period, and these plants had tissues to transport water and nutrients. Now, if you were to look today at celery, like a stalk of celery, you can see tubes in the celery. Okay, so you could kind of think of it like that. There are tissues that allow for transport of water and nutrients through the plants similar to in celery, where you have those tubes. So we started out with plants being seedless and vascular. Those were the first types of plants that were able to live on land, seedless vascular plants. And we still have plants like this today and they're ferns. And when you look at this picture on top here, these little dots on the underside of this leaf, those are spores. So instead of seeds, ferns reproduce using spores. Ferns need to live in moist areas. So they thrived in coal forming swamps during the Pennsylvanian period. So going back to that previous diagram here, the coal swamps, there would have been a lot of ferns living in there. Which provided a lot of the organic material in the swamp. You know, the, uh, the coal comes from organic material, like plant material. So then later on in the Paleozoic, we had the development of gymnosperms, which are seeded vascular plants. And that would have been during the Devonian is when we first see it in the fossil record. So having seeds now freed plants from having to live in moist conditions because they were no, no longer using spores, they now had seeds. 
So with seeds, plants were able to colonize more parts of the land, nearly all parts of land, because they did not have that restriction of having to live near moisture, <clears throat> like next to a coal swamp. They were still, they were flowerless though. So these gymnosperms did not have flowers, but they have seeds. Today, our examples of gymnosperms include conifers, which means they have pine cones, also cycads and ginkgos. So this is what a cycad looks like. So this comes from an ancient type of plant that started developing in the Devonian, in the Paleozoic. Here is an ancient ginkgo fossil. And this is what ginkgos look like today. And this is more about the Carboniferous coal swamp. So Pennsylvanian period swamps were responsible for the formation of the Earth's major coal deposits. And this is a representation of what one of those coal swamps may have looked like. Now, interesting here, there is this image of a dragonfly. And this person is shown next to the dragonfly to show a reference of size. Because the dragonflies at that time were huge. They, could have, they were like a meter long. So then what about reptiles? Reptiles first appeared in the Mississippian. That was during the Carboniferous. And reptiles are better adapted for life on land as compared to amphibians, let's say, because they had scales or the way that their skin is it's able to hold in moisture in their bodies. So once you have that, animals no longer need to live next to water or in water. You can live away from water because the skin is able to hold in the moisture. Now also, reptiles have eggs that they could hatch on land because the eggs had a hard shell, which keeps the moisture inside. So it's no longer like a similar to a fish egg. It has a hard shell. So reptiles were able to colonize all parts of land, whereas amphibians needed to still live near water. Okay, so reptiles adapted for life on land. Here's an example of an early reptile. It's called a pelicosaur. It's a fin back reptile that has this large fin on its back. Then we have these therapsids, which evolved from pelicosaurs. Therapsids were advanced reptiles that had mammal-like features. They became the dominant large land animal by the mid Permian. So going back to the Permian, that's all the way up here. So that's a lot more recent. So the therapsids included a group called the cynodonts. And the cynodonts is a group that gave rise to mammals around 225 million years ago, which is in the Triassic period. Besides mammals, all other animals that descended from therapsids went extinct. So mammals was the only group that came from therapsids that continued on. So keep in mind, over geologic history, there were many organisms that went extinct. Many, many more organisms lived on this earth than we could even talk about in this, um, you know, hour and 15 minute class. 
There were so there were so many organisms we probably didn't even discover yet. We may not have even found their fossils. Okay. So mammals are the only descendant from therapsids that did not go extinct. So you can see this therapsid. It looks like a reptile, but it had mammal-like features. So at the end of the Permian which is the end of the Paleozoic, there was a mass extinction. It was the greatest known mass extinction in Earth history. It was possibly caused by what we call a deep sea anoxia, which is a lack of oxygen in the deep ocean water, as well as increased carbon dioxide levels. And then perhaps there was no circulation of oxygen rich surface water to the deep ocean and then that would have led to this anoxia which is thought to be the reason of this mass extinction. So actually 90% of all of the marine invertebrate species that existed were extinct. They went extinct during this extinction. Okay, so only 10% of the marine invertebrate species survived. 65% of all amphibian and reptile species went extinct. So this was a huge mass extinction. Okay, so then we have the Mesozoic. This is the second era of the Phanerozoic. We consider this to be the age of the dinosaurs, and this includes the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. So here we have the numbers, the millions of years, ages. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Triassic, is the first period, then Jurassic, and then Cretaceous. And then here's another one of those diagrams that shows you the different pictures. So you see little dinosaurs running around in the Triassic. And then as you go on in time, the dinosaurs get larger. And that looks like a little rodent in there. And then also you have information about where the continents were at different times. And then here it says your first bird, your first er your um, your early mammals, and it talks about the continents. Okay, so, and then in your Cretaceous. The end of the Cretaceous is another mass extinction that we'll talk about. So in the early Mesozoic, that's the Triassic, Pangaea began to break apart. And that happened through continental rifting between Laurasia and Gondwana. And that continental rifting was by the late Triassic. Eventually, this rifting led to the formation of the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see here, this is a representation of where the continents were during the late Jurassic, which is about 150 million years ago. So you can see a mid-ocean mid ridge has developed between Africa and North America. And as we know today from the plate tectonics chapter, we have now that is a well-established mid-ocean ridge called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And then by the end of the Cretaceous, which is the end of the Mesozoic era, the eastern coast of North America is now separated from Africa, far, it's, you know, far spread apart. And now 
the eastern coast of North America is considered a passive continental margin, meaning it's far from any active plate boundaries. Okay, whereas here it was closer to an active plate boundary and then earlier than that it was um, a suture where you had a connection, Africa and North America were connected. So this is by the end of the Cretaceous, this is generally where the continents were located. They're starting to be in a more familiar location, familiar compared to today, okay? Like Antarctica is now in the Southern Hemisphere, close to the South Pole, right? Most of the continents are in general locations where they are today, okay? Although India, as we learned during the mountain building and plate tectonics lecture, India is still not connected to Asia yet. Okay, that didn't happen until later. So what about life in the Mesozoic? Organisms that survived the extinction at the end of the Paleozoic which was that Permian period, began to diversify. Again, diversify means you have a lot more species come into existence. And we see in the rock record, a lot more species appeared. So that's where we see the diver di diversification. So gymnosperms, those cycads, conifers, and ginkgos began the dominant trees in the Mesozoic. Reptiles became the dominant land animals in the Mesozoic. And this is a representation of the Jurassic period. So the first reptiles were small, but evolved rapidly. Now again, rapidly in geology means like, you know, it's a long time period, but in geology, it could be considered rapid. Okay, so like a couple of millions of years could be considered rapid, for example. So keep that in mind where it says rapidly. So particularly the dinosaurs evolved rapidly. But keep in mind also dinosaurs were not the only type of reptiles. You had other reptiles around, but dinosaurs evolved particularly rapidly and grew from small dinosaurs to large dinosaurs, like extremely large by the end of the Cretaceous. We had very large dinosaurs. So diversity of reptiles included large carnivorous dinosaurs, large herbivorous dinosaurs, for example, an Apatosaurus, which we see below, these are, this is a dinosaur fossil model of an Apatosaurus. And you see these two people standing here as a size reference. Then we had pterosaurs, which were flying reptiles, and something we call an Archaeopteryx, which is the predecessor of modern birds. So, the evolution of birds. One dinosaur lineage, which was a small two-legged dinosaur called theropods. They survived the extinction of dinosaurs actually. So when you say the dinosaurs went extinct, you did actually have one lineage of dinosaurs that actually did survive that extinction of dinosaurs. So we call those theropods. And again, they were small two-legged dinosaurs. They evolved into what we now call birds. And genetically, feathers are a modified scale. So dinosaurs had scales on their skin, but recent studies also suggest there were dinosaurs that had feathers because genetically, feathers and scales are similar. So 
it's not that difficult for organisms to either have feathers or scales because it's the same, it's similar gene. And when you look at modern birds, their legs and feet have scaly skin. Now, there are some fossils of dinosaurs that, that show feathers. So we do have some evidence that suggests that, dino that some dinosaurs may have had feathers. So this shows you the transitional fossil between dinosaurs and modern birds. And again, we call this an Archaeopteryx. So it's a bird-like dinosaur. It had dinosaur characteristics and bird-like characteristics. So the teeth were similar to dinosaurs, the tail, the brain size, and the hind limbs. But then it also had feathers and a wishbone like modern birds. So Archaeopteryx lived during the late Jurassic. And here's some information about it. And then you could read more at this link down here. There's more information about this Archaeopteryx. And here's a fossil. You can actually, there, you can see the feathers in the, that were fossilized. So what about mammals in the Mesozoic? So cynodonts were mammal-like reptile therapsids that gave rise to modern mammals. So mammals evolved from reptiles. So you see, you see there's a line. You have fish and then some fish evolved eventually into amphibians. And then you had, you know, you had the line then to evolve into reptiles. And then you had lineage of reptiles evolving into mammals. So these mammal-like reptiles had jaws and teeth that were similar to mammals, but they still did have some reptilian features. Now, during the Mesozoic, there was low mammal diversity, meaning there were only a few types of mammals. It wasn't like today where we have lots of different types of mammals. Okay, there were only a few. And all of the mammals species were relatively small in size. So like small rodent type mammals. And what about plants? We now, or towards the end of the Mesozoic in the Cretaceous, we had the first appearance of flowering plants and we call those angiosperms. Once we had flowering plants, it ended the dominance of the other two categories. You know, the ferns and the, gymnos the gymnosperms. Okay, so now the flowering plants became the dominant type of plants. They were adapted to all terrestrial habitats. Terrestrial means land. And the flowers attracted animal pollinators. And they also had seeds that were enclosed inside a fruit. And we see that today. If you're going to eat a fruit, there's seeds inside. So by the end of the Mesozoic, there was a mass extinction. It was about 65 million years ago. Many reptile groups became extinct. The dinosaurs seemed to vanish from the rock record after about 65 million years ago. A few types of reptile groups did survive, including turtles, snakes, and lizards. 90% of the plankton species in the ocean and 75% of plant species went extinct. The cause of the mass extinction is thought to have been a meteorite impact. The meteorite impact would have allowed material to get blasted into the atmosphere after the impact happened. 
So a meteorite hit the earth and then materials flew up into the atmosphere and blocked sunlight, which stopped photosynthesis and then disrupted food chains. So scientists have found a crater in, it's called the Chicxulub Crater in the Yucatan. And we went over this a little bit in the metamorphic chapter. If you want to go back, I showed you a picture of shocked quartz. It had little fractures in the quartz grains that um, they found the quartz near Haiti, which is near the Yucatan, which is it's near this Chuxalub crater. So you can look back at the metamorphic chapter. So besides the shock quartz, we also have evidence of an iridium rich clay layer, as well as carbon from burned vegetation. Okay, so here is where the Chicxulub crater is located. This is the Yucatan Peninsula. So a clay layer at this boundary with rocks younger than 65 million years old and rocks older than 65 million years old, at this boundary there is a clay layer with high amounts of iridium. Iridium is a metal that's associated with meteorite impacts because iridium is found on meteorites, but it's not something that you find in continental crust. Okay, so iridium tells us that there was an, a meteorite impact, okay? because iridium is associated with meteorites, but it's not normally found in the continental crust. So at this layer, we find clay that has iridium in it. And we find it in, other, in different parts of the world. Okay, it's not just like one location, it's like, you know, spread around. Um, as well as the burned carbon and shock quartz, okay. We find it spread around a little bit. Um, for example, like the shocked quartz was found in Haiti, which is near the Chicxulub crater, but it's not like in that circle. It's, you know, it's nearby, but it's not in that section. So, it's, you know, materials were spread around a little bit. So above any, any iridium rich clay layers, anywhere in the world that are found between the 65 million year, you know, younger versus older. Nowhere in the world is there any dinosaur fossils found in rocks younger than 65 million years. Okay, so that is strong evidence that dinosaurs went extinct because nowhere in the world are there dinosaur fossils in rocks younger than 65 million years. Okay, except for that bird lineage, the, uh, the fossil, um, the dinosaur lineage that led to the rise of modern birds. Okay, that's an exception to this. Okay, so here, we have in Colorado, you have this white layer that contains elevated levels of iridium and shocked mineral grains. Pollen and spores from Cretaceous plants are found immediately below the layer, but not above it. Okay, this is paraphrase from this site down here. So if you want to see more information about it, you can see, um, you can go to this site, okay? So this white layer here is in Colorado. So this is not next to the Chicxulub crater, 
right? So, but it, it was ejected, you know, materials were ejected into the atmosphere and then fell elsewhere. But you can see clearly it's an actual layer that's visible. Okay, so then we're in the Cenozoic, which is the third era of the Phanerozoic. And you have, let me go back for a second. So the Cenozoic is all the way up here, just to clarify what we're looking at. All the way up here, this tiny sliver is the Cenozoic. And then it branches out enlarged, so you can see the very, very top is called the Quaternary, and we have the Neogene and the Paleogene. And then branching out so we can see, like zoomed in more, the, the Quaternary is broken down into the Pleistocene, and then we have the Holocene. So we are in the Holocene epoch right now. That's where we are today, in the Holocene. Okay, the Pleistocene is like the Ice Ages. If you ever see, so like the cartoons, the Ice Ages, okay, that's the Pleistocene. The Neogene, we have the Pliocene and the Miocene. And then the Paleogene is Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. Again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize all these words, but just keep in mind that they're there. You can always reference back to that slide. Okay, so here is just snips of what I just showed you. Okay, so we're going to be talking about that Cenozoic, including various parts of this time scale here. And then here's another one of those diagrams, and we see the to the left was still the Cretaceous, okay? And then here's 66 million years ago. So this is right after the mass extinction. You're starting to have large mammals. Okay, here's a primate. Here are your, for your modern humans is all the way here. Okay, and again, you could read more information about the mountains and look at the continents. Okay, so much of the present day geography developed during the Cenozoic. Okay, we have the continents are generally in their locations. It shows you mountain belts, present day mountain belts, right, the Himalayans. Alps, direction of plate movement, it shows where the equator is. Okay, so you can take a look at that. Mammals replaced reptiles as the dominant vertebrates on land during the Cenozoic. And then we had diversification of mammals. So there were two major groups of mammals that evolved, the marsupials and the placentals. And then there is a third group that's called the monotremes. So your marsupials give birth to immature young, which then go into a pouch to finish development. So here is a kangaroo. So kangaroos are examples of marsupials, also wombats, koala bears, opossums. So marsupials have short pregnancies, and then the immature young will go into the pouch and finish growing for a while. Right, for a while, I'm saying, because each, each animal is going to have a different period of time. So, by the way, opossums are the only marsupial native to the United States um, 
the only marsupial native here, the opossum. Then we have placentals, where the animal has a placenta that nourishes the embryo. So placentals have long pregnancies. So the baby is not as immature as in a marsupial when it's born. 90% of all mammals are placentals, including primates. We are primates. So it's actually advantageous for the embryo to stay inside the womb as long as possible for development. And some placental mammals can actually walk soon after birth. So, so this is advantageous to be to for placentals to have come into existence. Okay, so sometimes you might see on like a nature show that um, an elephant is born, and then soon after being born, the baby elephant can like walk along with its parents. Okay. Um, I think elephants are pregnant for almost two years, something like that. And then, so, but they're able to be born and be able to walk around. So it's more advantageous if you're going to try and avoid predators. Okay, so other animals like baby deer, baby horses, you know, they can walk sort of soon after they're born. I don't know like the exact time period, like how long it takes, but they're able to walk soon after birth. Okay, so that's easier for them to then go with their parents on whatever journey they're going on and avoid predators. Then we have monotremes. Now monotremes are really interesting because they still have a reptilian feature. Okay, they maintained a reptilian feature, which is that they lay eggs. They lay eggs like reptiles and birds, but they're mammals. So a duckbill platypus, which is here, an echidna, this is an echidna, which is a spiny anteater. Now, all monotremes from Australia, or they live in Australia, okay? The echidna is kind of cute, right? It's cute. So is the platypus, very cute. Um, yeah, so those are monotremes that maintained the reptilian feature of laying eggs, but they're still mammals. So what about plants? Flowering plants strongly influence the evolution of both birds and herbivorous mammals throughout the Cenozoic. So this is a mural that shows animals during the Miocene, which is 23 to 5.3 million years ago. So this is before the ice ages happened, and these are Miocene mammals. So you can look that over. And then we have a Pliocene epoch, which is also before the ice ages. So these are Pliocene mammals. So I just wanna take a minute to look over some of these with you. So this back here kind of looks like an elephant, but the trunk looks different, right? But look at these animals here. They kind of look like, like deer or like gazelles type animals, but they have this snout that sticks up and then there are horns on it. And here is an early horse, okay? But these are really interesting. We don't have animals that look like this today. And here's a little, these kind of look like 
uh, woodchucks type animals. Now, some mammals became very large. So during the ice ages, we had very, very large species. We had mastodons, mammoths, giant bison, ground sloths, giant camels in North America, by the way. Camels originated in, in America. And then camels eventually migrated across a land bridge during the ice ages. They migrated to Asia. But camels originated in America. We also had giant birds that weighed 1,100 pounds. Nearly all large species went extinct by the end of the ice ages. Perhaps it was related to climate change, or it may have been related to overhunting by humans. So this shows you the maximum advance of the ice sheet in North America during the Pleistocene ice ages. Okay, so for example, New York City was under ice. We were under glacial ice. All this white is glacial ice. Then over here, it's sea ice. And then here is a land bridge, which helped some organisms cross over to Asia. This is an example of a large Pleistocene mammal. Large animals we call megafauna. So this is a mylodon, an extinct ground sloth. And it says here, among the diverse Pliocene and Pleistocene mammals of Florida were six meter long giant sloths. Now I wrote long slash high because if they're, if they're on all four legs, it's long, but if they stand up, it's high. Okay, they also had armored mammals known as glyptodonts that weighed more than two metric tons. There were also large, um, we also had horses, camels, elephants, different carnivores, and a variety of rodents that were around during the Pliocene and Pleistocene. These are some woolly mammoths. These are relatives of modern elephants. They went extinct at the end of the ice ages. Here are Pliocene and Pleistocene mammals. Okay, you have your sloth, your mastodon, your mammoth. Here's a bear kind of hiding in the background there. Here's a horse, a camel, a bison, an anteater. This is your glyptodon. Okay, it's armored. When you think of armored animals, you can sort of think of like an armadillo, okay, which ha it has like an armor to it. Here's a wolf. Here is a cyber-toothed tiger. Okay. So then what about primates? The fossil record provides clues that primates evolved from small, tree-dwelling, insect-eating mammals about 65 million years ago. Primate characteristics originated in adaptations for living in trees. So primates have limber shoulder joints that allow for swinging from branch to branch. Primates have agile hands that can grasp branches in order to hang from them and also can, can manipulate food easily, like opening up nuts or peeling open fruit. You have agile hands to do that. Also, primates have eyes that are close together on the front of the face, which enhances depth perception and eye-hand coordination, which is necessary 
for swinging around in high trees because you want to be able to see the branches that you're going to swing onto. So these are primate characteristics related to living in trees. Also, primates are attentive parents. So they generally have single births and they nurture their offspring for a long period of time. Now, humans never lived in trees, but humans retained many of the traits in a modified form that originated in early tree-dwelling primates. So if we look back, humans have limber shoulder joints, okay? So if you're gonna go on the monkey bars in a playground, you're able to do that if you have limber shoulder joints, okay? Like an elephant is not able to go on the monkey bars on a playground. Okay, but primates, including humans, can. Humans have agile hands that you can grasp the monkey bars, you can grasp food, you can peel a banana, you know, we can use a scissor, things like that. And humans have eyes that are close together, right? If you look at an elephant, the eyes are on the different sides of the head from each other. So if that's not eyes that are close together on the front of the face. So humans retained a lot of the original traits from primates that primates evolved with as adaptations for living in trees. But there was no evidence that humans ever lived in trees. So humans and chimpanzees branched from a common ancestral species 65, sorry, six to seven million years ago, which is considered recent in geologic history. So humans did not evolve from chimpanzees. Humans and chimpanzees branched off from a common ancestor six to seven million years ago. So chimpanzees and humans differ in that human brains are larger and humans can walk upright. That's called being bipedal. So humans walk upright and have larger brains than chimpanzees. All members of the human family are called hominins. There were approximately 20 species of fossil hominins that have been discovered in the fossil record. For example, let's just add that, in the fossil record. For example, Neanderthals are an example of a hominin. At times, different species of hominins actually coexisted. So here, we have your common ancestor of humans and great apes existed. And then you had branching off about six or seven million years ago, you had branching off of your chimpanzees and your humans branched off from that common ancestor. At this time, I think that common ancestor is still unknown. I don't think we actually have a fossil of that common ancestor, but we know there was a common ancestor that, the, that we branched off from and that chimpanzees branched off from. So your early humans, these are the skulls, okay? Now, at some point we had this Australopithecus afarensis Australopithecus africanus, your Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis. Eventually, we had our Homo sapiens, which we are. Okay, we are Homo sapiens. But you look at the different skull shape, the different skull size. Okay, we have a flatter skull in the front of the face, whereas the 
early hominins had more this the face projected outward more okay and then here are your african great apes your chimpanzee bonobo and your gorilla okay so again there's a common misconception that humans evolved from monkeys or from apes but it's more that we have a common ancestor So here is a representation of an Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, so it's, it's a model of what scientists have come up with as what they would have looked like. Okay, so this is an early hominin species. Again, that's over here. About three to four million years ago the Australopithecus afarensis, which is this. And then we have Lucy is an Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy. Lucy is a fossil, a female fossil that was found. It's 3.2 million year old fossil. And this just shows you the height difference and the skeletal structure differences between chimpanzee, modern human, and Lucy. Again, Lucy is a particular female fossil of the Australopithecus afarensis species. So that brings us to the end of the geologic history lecture.